What's up guys, it's Nick. 2021 was an extremely weird year and I think we all know why. But it was a pretty good year for tech and a pretty bad year for my wallet. I bought a ton of tech this year. Some of it cool, some of it useful, and some of it just things that I wanted. I thought about making a full list of what I bought and I actually did, so I'll throw it up on screen right now. But I think that's just a bit boring, so instead of that, let's do a top 10-ish of the things I bought or got sent this year. This list won't be in any particular order, but I'll try to keep it from the lowest to the highest price point and give you a little bit of info about each item. I've also done some reviews on these items, so you can check those in the cards above. And there's going to be affiliate links down below, which do give me a little bit of a commission out of each item, and it really helps the channel out. But let's stop talking and let's go to the first item keyboards. I got sent a ton of keyboards to review this year, and I think I only ended up reviewing three. You see, on the lower end of the spectrum, keyboards priced between $50 to $80 are really similar. You're mainly looking at a few key features which distinguishes them. Build quality, build design, software quality, if they're hot swap or not, and the keycaps that they come included with. It does come down to personal preference, but finding a keyboard that does all these things pretty good isn't really that difficult. In my case, I think the best budget keyboard right now is the RK61. With it being hot swap now, as well as having a decent build quality, including PBT keycaps and having the Bluetooth feature if you're into that, I think this is the best budget keyboard coming in at around $50. If you're willing to spend a bit more on build quality, the Keymove Snowfox is the keyboard that I on occasions use, and it's the one that I would recommend coming in at around $80. For those who want something a bit more customizable and pricier, I'd recommend you check the GMMK Pro and delve into the custom keyboard game. Going into 2022, I plan on building my own custom keyboard and maybe checking out group buys like the Yeki 68. It's just so cool and hey, we all use keyboards. Staying with gaming peripherals, let's move on to mice. I used to use the Corsair Scimitar Pro since I mainly played MMOs, but about a year ago, Logitech came out with a new mouse. Well, actually, it was an old mouse that they made lighter, but you know what I mean. You probably already know what this is, but if you don't, it's the Logitech G Pro Superlight in white. I was playing a lot of Valorant at the time, and I needed a better FPS mouse. And since it came in white, it just fit in really well with my white aesthetic with my setup. Even though it's wireless, I haven't had a single issue with latency. It's super accurate. I hardly ever charge it, and it lasts ages. It's super comfortable. And as the name implies, it's super light, coming in at around 63 grams. For me, this is the best gaming mouse on the market, but it does come at a hefty price point at around $150. But hey, you pay for quality and aesthetics. I've also got a new addition to my ever-growing mouse collection, and that's the Logitech MX Master 3. I've been using this mouse for editing and all-around workflow with my Mac. I'll say what I have to say about this for when I actually do my review on it, which should come soon, but hey, for an all-around workflow, editing, production-style mouse, this is amazing at $100, and you should buy it. Moving on to probably the most exciting bit of tech, storage. Okay. Maybe not, but everyone could use an external SSD or hard drive. Whether it's for keeping documents, projects, entire libraries, you need a storage solution, specifically an SSD. These things are getting very fast, very big, with a very tiny form factor, as well as a decent price point, which honestly just makes it all the better. Now you can use whatever brand you're partial to. I prefer SanDisk as I like the look, the feel, and the price point. But Samsung has some pretty good options as well. I do everything off of this little guy. I edit off of it, I take it everywhere, I store all my files, and it's pretty safe to say that my whole YouTube channel is on this guy. But I would recommend you also have a backup, which is just a Samsung hard drive, just for safekeeping. The SanDisk Extreme Portable SSD comes in at around $90 for half a terabyte. And there are bigger, pricier versions of this, but I recommend this one. But now let's get on to audio. My most viewed video this year, as well as my favorite studio headphones, are the Biodynamic DT990 Pros. There are a lot of similar priced headphones, like the MX50s, and I have tried them. But for the price, the quality, and the open back style headphones, these are just amazing for sound quality. Apart from production work, watching movies, YouTube, or even gaming with these gives a whole world of difference than using a speaker or a headset. But it does come with some issues. 
being 250 ohm headphones, they're extremely difficult to drive. I had been using my Scarlett Solo for the past year since I've been using it for my microphone, and even though I know they weren't driving them to its full potential, it was still very usable. But now with the new MacBook preamps, they get extremely loud and I can use them at 50% and they sound just amazing. The one other issue you might have is after using them for so long, the ear pads will get pretty thin and you might have to replace them. But there are third party sellers that sell them at a reasonable price point and it's just easy to find. Buyer Dynamic did come out with a new alternative this year with the DT900 Pro X, but I still have to try those out, so let me know if you want to see a review on those. And if you're not a fan of headphones, well, there's these guys. Yeah, it's the AirPods Pro. But why am I included something that I bought back in 2019 for this year? Well, I've actually been losing these and rebuying them consistently for the past two years. You might say I have a love-hate relationship with them. On one hand, the sound quality is very good compared to other similar styled earphones. The seamless transition between other Apple devices as well as the aesthetic is a huge plus. On the other hand, I have one of those ear canals, they just don't seem to fit, making them pretty uncomfortable and they do fall on occasion. They used to be quite pricey at around $250 for my first pair, but for my last pair I paid $180 which I do think is a very fair price tag. Hopefully this year they'll come out with something new and it's even better than these ones. Now the one thing I think everyone needs, and bear with me, is a 3D printer. I don't need this a strong word, but it just makes life so much easier. I bought an Ender 5 Pro back in March, and I know it's not the most budget friendly thing on the list, but it is one of the most useful things I've bought in 2021. From replacement parts to Echo Dot holders, meme keycaps, to the replacement mouse wheel that I used to fix my three year old broken mouse with, the limit is just really how imaginative you are. For those everyday fixes you might need, don't think of a printer as just that piece of tech that a hobbyist buys. Think of it as a tool. It's truly something that will change how you fix things, and even though the initial investment might seem high, it is worth it in the long run. Now, I didn't buy the most entry-level printer, but it was still fairly budget at around $250, and you really don't need more. But let's move on. You probably noticed that I'm not at my usual setup. I'm actually at my parents' home for holidays, which means I don't have all my gear. If you're recording any type of video, you know that lighting is a very key factor. And Aperture just came out with a tiny 60 watt cob light, which is what I'm using right now. This is the Amaran 60D, and boy does it pack a punch. For $160, this thing is so small, makes no noise, you can use an app to manage it, comes with a V-mount plate which means you can power it off MPF batteries or V-mount batteries. It's just crazy what it does for it being so tiny. I've been using a Godox SO60 watt and even though it's a fairly budget option, it's big, makes a lot of noise and honestly, it's just clunky. It's always nice to add more lighting to your videos as it can really up your game. I've only had this for 5 days and it's blown my mind. I just need those MPF batteries that I ordered to arrive and spend another $200 on a softbox. But I'll have my review on this very soon. But now let's go to the more expensive purchases of this year and let's start off with my camera. Well, my camera and lens because you do need both. I've been using the Canon N50 Mark II for all my videos over the past year. It has been quite the learning experience since I did start off with an iPhone 11 Pro for all my early videos. But the footage I've managed to capture with this has been pretty great all things considered. I'm not a photographer, I don't have a background in videography, far from it, but it has been easy to learn and record videos for this YouTube channel over the past 11 months or so. I bought the camera body for about $700, and the lens, the Sigma 16mm 1.4, adds a very creamy image for about $400. This is considered an entry-level APS-C mirrorless camera, but the colors, intuitive menus, amazing autofocus, small form factor have all been checklists that I've needed for my videos. It's not perfect though. I record my A-roll in 1080p 24 frames per second since its 4K is kind of lacking with autofocus and honestly the crop is just way too much. Moreover, I do use CineStyle as a picture profile since these cameras don't come with C-Log and it's the closest that I could get to a log profile but the image is still pretty good in my opinion. Another issue with this camera is the lens selection. 
Even though Sigma did save it with its three main lenses, it only comes with 27 different lenses for the EFM mount. This makes it really hard for me to recommend it since future-proofing is something that I really believe in. Sony did come out with a competitor for this and it's the CVE-10. It uses the same compact camera format, but it uses Sony E-mount. This means you can go onto a full frame in the future and not have to change lenses. I do think Canon has better color science and it's easier to use, which is why it's been my go-to camera for the past year, and I think I'm finally at a place where I can actually review this. I do think I'm gonna go to the full frame very soon and I might be switching things up. Speaking of switching things up, have you seen the image quality over the past 10 seconds? Well, I've been recording everything on the iPhone 13 Pro Max. I bought this a few months ago and I decided to go with the bigger version this time. I usually buy a new iPhone every year just because if you resell at the right time, you can actually break even. But that's a story for a different time. Apple did a really good job with just two key features, and those are ProMotion and Cinematic Mode. ProMotion just gives us that refresh rate that people have been asking for years now. If you ever swap between a low to a high refresh rate monitor, you know how stunning the difference is. And it's the same for this display. It might seem small, but it's quite pleasing to see. Now, Cinematic Mode basically made this a mirrorless camera competitor. Being able to manage aperture and exposure, as well as having a 12 megapixel sensor, a 13, 26, and 70 millimeter lens, ranging from f1.5 to 2.8 with your mobile device, is something no one would have expected a few years ago. And what's more, Apple's color signs, as well as the cinematic software for blurry backgrounds, or bokeh, and the face tracking for focus, is just miles ahead of any other smartphone manufacturer. To put it in perspective, my camera rig is about $1,100, which is about the same as an entry-level Pro Max. Yes, the image quality on my camera and the dynamic range is much better, but take into consideration that this also doubles as a phone and you can choose from three lenses. Not many people will outright spend $1,000 on a camera, but if you spend a little bit more on your phone, you can also have a great camera if you're starting out YouTube or anything else that requires videography. There's channels like SpawnPoint who exclusively records his videos with an iPhone, and he makes my videos look lackluster. Also, it comes in a pretty share of blue, and this is definitely a tool to use. And finishing everything off within the Apple ecosystem, my favorite piece of tech this year, my MacBook. This is the MacBook Pro 14 inch M1 Pro, and I had to travel to get this. I've been using Macs for over 10 years now. The sleek design and Mac OS are something that I can really appreciate. I'd been using a MacBook from 2015, and even though it was getting slower, I didn't have a reason to change it yet. But this year was the year that Apple finally bit the bullet and changed absolutely everything. Yes, the M1 chip came out in November last year, but these MacBook Pros are just completely mind-blowing. I have a decent gaming rig, which is what I was using to edit all these videos. And that little MacBook just blows it out of the water. Smooth 4K timelines, no overheating, no fan noise, portability. This machine just does everything right. Having all the ports back, an HDMI port, and the return of MagSafe, which I actually never lost due to me keeping my old one for so long. It's just something that Apple hadn't been doing for the past years. And the screen, well, it's for a loss of words, beautiful. I actually haven't been able to switch completely to an external monitor just because of how amazing, color accurate, and smooth the screen is. I've yet to review this absolute tool, but if you're curious into how I use it in a day of the life, you can click on the card above. And that's it for 2021. Oh wait, I, I actually bought a drone. I, I don't know why, it was expensive, but I guess it's cool and cinematic. But yeah, those were my best purchases for 2021. Tech was really amazing this year, and we can all just hope that next year will be even better. Getting real with you guys, this year has been absolutely amazing. My channel really picked up this year, and it's been motivating me to make even better content. Yes, it's been difficult. Yes, we have a long way to go, but this is only the beginning. And next year, I plan on picking up the pace and being as consistent as I can with content creation. So if you're enjoying anything that I put out and it's helpful to you, remember that a like and a sub go a long way. I hope you're all doing well with your family and friends. Happy New Year's and thank you for making 2021 an amazing year. Now let's go get 2022. See ya.